I was going to go into the breakout room. I can see there's a few people in the in the room. I'll go. I'll go. I might go over lunch at some point. See if anyone's in there. Do I look attractive enough? Harry <laughs> <laughs> <Very> Grant, like. <laughs> I was going to say, I actually have, I was going to show you this lovely, <laughs> can you see that? It, it, says, it reminds me to record, sorry, it's uh, not in oh, Okay. <laughs> it reminds me to re press the record button. <laughs> Good. I've hit record too. To <laughs> oh, I've hit record too. Oh, it's recording already. Yeah, no, but you should record. I'm, I'm recording, but you should also record. And I don't know if Alex is recording as well. Yeah, no, no, it is already. We're already recording. The, yeah, so the yeah, recording. my screen. Yeah, my screen shows it's recording too. So I can't. I can't record from. Yeah, I can't either. And, uh, just so the others can hear, I just told Becca this a few minutes ago. My, my um, microphone on my PC has a, a bit of a reputation for not being great. So what I've done is I put on a microphone that I normally use for my guitar instead. If, if this proves it's not working, just tell me. <laughs> but I, I think it should be okay. All right. Sounds okay. crystal clear. Excellent. As long as you don't play the guitar. Well, <laughs> it's funny you should say that, but. <laughs> right, anyway, we should uh, start. Got, you do know the latest show song, don't you, Andre? Because of course you'll be required <laughs> to sing it at the end. <laughs> Okay, I'll do that in the introduction. So we'll just give a, another 15 seconds or so until people get back. 15 seconds, sorry, Cal. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a, a good break. Um, we now have a talk by Paul Burton, who's going to give us an introduction to Data Shield and uh, may even grace us later on with the Data Shield song on his guitar. But first of all, there's uh, this talk coming up, so we're, we're very much looking forward to that. Over to you, Paul. He has just popped away from his screen. <laughs> Run away. I know, yeah. <laughs> he's, I don't know whether he's gone to get his guitar, maybe for the song later on. Um, yeah. <laughs> he should be back I missed in that. I had, the, I had the video bit on, on minimised. <laughs> so, um, so just a slight delay, everybody. We do have Paul coming up in a minute to give us a, a perspective on Day Shield and, and to provide us with an introduction. Um, And for those of you who don't know, I'm sure everybody knows, but Paul is essentially the founder of Data Shield and has uh, steered the project through a uh, number of different institutions. He's now currently at the University of Newcastle in the north of England, where he is professor of data science for health. And now he's back and he's going to talk to us about Data Shield and introduction. Great. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Andre. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking Andre and Becca for their excellent summary of the backdrops in the development of the project and the history leading up to this conference uh, in the first two presentations today. Uh, so I've been asked to provide an introduction to Data Shield, and I think I should start by echoing the key message from both Andre and Becca that Data Shield is now really very much a community-led project. Um, however, there does have to be a central team to drive forward key elements of the development work. And I've been very fortunate to lead that central team since 2009. This, this has been my, by a very long way, my most favorite project the whole of my career. Um, however, I, I'm now admittedly getting a bit old and feeble. Um, and as I'm coming up to retirement, I'm absolutely delighted that the baton of the leadership of the central team is now being passed to Becca Wilson, uh, who has been a central member of the team almost as long as me, but she's not as old as me. Um, this means that the, uh, the central team, which has most recently been led from Newcastle University, is now going to move over to being led from the University of Liverpool. Given what I've already seen today, it's clear that Data Shield is going to be in really good hands. Um, and that this conference 
it seems to me to be a wonderful first step into an exciting and sustainable future for data shield. Okay, so the Great. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do in this uh, presentation, uh, particularly for the people who've not worked with Data Shield before, and I apologise to people who are used to Data Shield and have heard this presentation before, but for the people who've not heard it before, I'm going to be talking about um, why you need Data Shield, what it is, and uh, briefly how it works. Okay, so the key philosophy underpinning Data Shield is that all of us who are involved in uh, analysis in epidemiology or really in any other area of science um, know that what we really want to be able to work with most of the time is individual level data. So that data collected on individuals um, and uh, quite often uh, by informaticians, these are called microdata. So those two terms are synonymous. Um, and these are fundamental to analysis, certainly fundamental to analysis in health science, but there are key constraints on their analysis and sharing. Um, the first group of constraints uh, arises as being described really nicely this morning by Meta for, on the ethical, legal or other governance restrictions. So um, there's all sorts of reasons why you can't just freely hand your uh, uh, microdata to uh, other people. There's also, a, 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 th th those constraints tend to be particularly a major issue uh, in health science, social science, where there's a human element, uh, and therefore you have to abide by the important uh, governance on uh, human data. It, it rise from the basically maintaining control of intellectual property or the commercial assets that appear in a data set. Now, in one way, that can be read as being, ooh, that's a Paul, oh, I think we might have lost your audio there. You may have lost Paul. He, he's, he's still connected. Um, I'm not sure why the screen just stopped sharing though. Um, let's give him a minute to see if he comes back again. Um, Elaine, could you possibly maybe phone him? There he is. He started screen sharing again. So, Paul, we lost you part way through your slide three. And we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, so I have no idea whether that was my end or your end? I think it was uh, probably your end because it happened to multiple people. Yeah. All right, okay, Could well, you, let's, let's try, you were try part way through slide three. Yeah, okay. Oh no, I've actually finished, Andre. Sorry, did you miss the finish? Sorry, that was a, a stupid joke. I apologize. So can you hear me? Yep, still? perfect. And we're back right, where you okay. were. So Basically, we're talking about main. Uh, so the second reason is maintaining control of intellectual property uh, or commercial uh, assets. And um, basically, one one of the reasons for this, in fact, relates to the potential use of data shield in developing countries. In that, if you are in a developing country and you've spent virtually all the available resources that you've got to create a data set that you'd like to be used, then you might not be very happy about just giving up your data to people in uh, Europe or America, uh, because you know full well that they can then get access to 
lots of money to analyze it, which means that you can get excluded from the whole process of developing the data. So um, basically, there are a number of reasons uh, that relate to the uh, maintaining control of intellectual property or commercial assets. Then the final reason for not sharing uh, microdata is the physical size of the data, particularly things like uh, genomic um, full, full uh, genome sequencing, et cetera. These are huge data sets and you really don't want to be throwing those around uh, in a way that makes them, uh, that, that takes up a lot of uh, time and space to do. Okay, so back in 2009, we then, we therefore worked on developing this, uh, or started work on developing this approach, day shield approach. Philosophy is to take the analysis to the data, not the data to the analysis. Basically, we wish to be able to leave the data to be analyzed on local servers behind firewalls where they usually live anyway. The analysis center, so this is outside those firewalls and may just be my laptop, for example, is gonna issue analysis commands and will receive back results that allow us to coordinate parallel analyses across multiple sources simultaneously. Another part of the philosophy is that the client server architecture should be based on open source freeware. Analytic commands are gonna be an R and we've basically uh, chosen to focus on R for reasons that I won't go into now, um, but there are good reasons why we use R. And these result in studies generating non-disclosive summary statistics, which are the, the things that then allow us to tie the results from all the studies together. And these can include uh, summary statistics that we are used to seeing, things like means and proportions, but they also include other more sophisticated summary statistics like information matrices and score vectors. And crucially, those things are the summary statistics that underpin full maximum likelihood solutions to uh, analyses. So basically, uh, summary statistics doesn't, using summary statistics doesn't mean that you're limiting the range of analyses that you can turn, you can do. Okay, so the, the plan is that you uh, get these summary statistics produced from the analysis in each of the studies. That's returned to the analysis center, which combines them to then produce either study specific results or pooled results across all studies. There's active multi-component disclosure control that I'm gonna tell you about uh, in a minute. Uh, but the minimum bottom line is that in, in no circumstances when people are using DataShield can the analyst, analyst see, copy, or extract individual level data that's held at the studies. And finally, another part of the philosophy is that the, the, the actual analytic process, as well as all options for disclosure control, are located with the microdata, so they're under the control of the um, of the study custodian. So I'm just going to, can I ask how, how much time I've already taken? Because I lost that block. I'm a bit lost where I've got to. You're about 10 minutes through. 10 minutes through. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so first of all, so data shield it can be used for looking at data that's over multiple sources. And in situations where you're doing that, there are two forms of multiple sources. There's first of all, when you've got horizontal partitioning, and this is where different sources hold all the variables you need, but obviously on different individuals. And this is the meta-analysis setting. Um, and so to date, almost all of the applications of data shield and most of the development have been focused on horizontal partitioning. However, literally in the last week, uh, we've now got a use case that we're gonna, we've started working on for vertical partitioning. And this is where different sources hold different variables on the same individuals. So one source might include some epidemiological results, one some GP practice data, one some educational results. And then you're gonna analyze those together um, and this is therefore a record linkage setting. So the vast bulk of what I'm talking about today is the horizontal data shield, but be aware that this uh, vertical one is now developing. 
Okay, so this is a schema of, of what actually happens. So uh, imagine we're in a setting where we've got uh, six studies, each of these being uh, having a, a data processing server, which is holding the data. And imagine these might all be in, in five different countries uh, in Europe and one in Canada, for example. The key principles of Data Shield is going to do two things. It's going to enable federated analysis. And this means that it can analyze all of these studies remotely. Um, and it, uh, a specific case of federated analysis, in fact, is when you analyze one, only one study, but you're uh, analyzing it remotely. So it, it, Data Shield can do that as well. Um, and the other issue about Data Shield is it's got active tailored disclosure control that I'll tell you more about. So as a schema, you can see you've got these six different data sets, each with their data processing server. The analysis computer sends commands through the, the web links, the green arrows, uh, to the data processing server. Uh, the commands go, uh, go through the uh, firewall. Uh, the analysis is done, and then that returns the results. And those results are then uh, either uh, reported separately for each study by the analysis computer, or you do a pooled analysis, or you end up doing a bouncing issue where you send, keep sending new commands uh, to the data processing service to allow you to fit an iterative model. And so, for example, this is what's used for generalized linear modeling. Now, a key part of the uh, disclosure control is this thing that I'm showing schematically as a diode, which is maybe not a particularly good thing the thing with a triangle and the line in it. And the way that parser works is that the only way that you can get commands into the data processing servers are from the outside through this parser. And the parser looks at all analysis commands as they come through. Uh, and it checks that first of all, that they're genuine data shield commands. Secondly, that they have the right um, arguments that they're allowed to have. And thirdly, that there are no illegal characters uh, held in there, what you've sent, which could, for example, be used to try and uh, hack into the, the servers. So th the parser is really central to uh, Data Shield. And every time you write a new, we as developers develop a new function, that is then added to the list that's allowable through the parser. Um, so in a minute, I'm gonna tell you more about control and disclosure control, but just so that you know, what I'm meaning by controlling disclosure risk is that we want to control the risk that a data analyst is able either accidentally or deliberately to infer the identity of one or more of the individuals being analyzed and or to infer the value of key variables characterizing those individuals. Um, the final thing to say on this slide is that the um, single site data shield uh, was a natural development after we worked on the multi-site data shield for two or three years, we realized that if we're building in all these layers of disclosure control, we might as well use them to allow people to get remote but secure access to a single uh, data processing server. Okay, so I've mentioned pooling data, pooling results over studies, and there are two ways that data shield will do this. The first one is called a variety of things, none of which are ideal uh, names for it. But these the things we use include the term virtual pooling um, or individual level IPD, so uh, individual patient data analysis. That's the term that's often used by meta analysts or full joint, joint likelihood, which when in an iterative model, you're basically going to fit uh, something that deals with all of the, the, in this case, six studies at the same time. The first one, the virtual pooling, is mathematically identical to physically pooling all the data in a central warehouse. And if, for example, you fit GLIM using the function dsglim, which is a, um, a virtual pooling function, then not only do you get the exactly the same results, and this is to uh, however many um, decimal places you want to carry, but you can also see that the uh, at each iteration of the uh, of the function it has the same iteration as would happen if you were analyzing the data altogether. So it really is fitting exactly the same model. And we've got a papers that demonstrate that if anybody wants to know more about it. 
The second approach uh, is instead of uh, asking all the studies to fit the model simultaneously, you send a command from the analysis computer saying to each study, fit a, a generalized linear model uh, to your data, but fit it to completion. And when you've finished, send back to the center the uh, regression coefficients and their standard errors. And once you've got them, you're then in a position where you can do a uh, study level meta-analysis using random effects meta-analysis. So this is exactly the same mathematically as often happens in, in a slow way when people, for example, in genomics, ask every study to fit, fit the, uh, all the markers they want to analyze, send the results to the center and the center uh, pulls them all together. The big difference is that the center controls everything here, which means that if you want to do new analyses that you've not thought of before, like for example, adding interactions, then you could just simply add those to your command. You don't have to wait two or three weeks while the uh, studies each do those analyses for you. Do these approaches work? And the answer is yes, both the uh, study level meta-analysis and the full likelihood both work. And we have a, a number of papers demonstrating that that's the case. Okay, so in many ways now, our most important uh, aim is to be uh, doing more things with disclosure risk. As it stands at the moment, there are a whole series of elements to the disclosure risk control that, uh, that Data Shield implements. First of all, general rule, you should always, you should never be building Data Shield on sort of hardware that's not very good or is porous to people doing hacking. You should be basically building on robust, robust hardware and any information that you're spreading around uh, between the computers in the system should be encrypted in the same way that you encrypt uh, standard encryption methods that you'd use in any other situation on the, uh, on the web. So first that. Second thing, data shield should never be being used unless it's being used in situations where there are formal governance agreements. And so following on from the discussions we had earlier, what we're wanting to do is to develop the data shield uh, technology in parallel to making sure that the governance agreements and everything are, are consistent with that um, and, uh, and deal with it appropriately. Okay, other uh, issues that, call, that lead to mit that mitigate disclosure risk, first of all, server-side R, so the R running in the, uh, in the Opal uh, data processing servers is only call callable via the Opal with that commands coming in from the, uh, the parser. The parser, as I said already, only allows uh, valid characters and functions. In addition, if you actually look at the range of things that are called server-side functions, i.e. the functions that can run in these server-side processes. These don't allow any functions that directly produce disclosed output. So for example, there is no print function uh, in a data shield uh, R, as opposed to there being one in, um, in standard R. And that's because if you do the print function, then it uh, then prints all the data out. Um, similarly, you, when you're using generalized linear modeling, you can't use the Glim residuals uh, command because that would allow a separate residual to be calculated for every single observation. And again, that is, that is disclosure. With e every function has disclosure traps and best example of these are for a, a function that's creating uh, a table as a minimum cell size that you allow. And the, uh, in addition for generalized linear models, you can't fit models that are effectively saturated i.e. ones that where there are as many um, uh, covariates as there are uh, data points, because those ones are also directly lead to, uh, to disclosive output. The, uh, crucially, the data custodian controls the trap threshold. So for example, uh, if the normal minimum cell size is three, which is one we often quite often set, if you've got a data custodian who's actually overseeing data being used in a rare disease analysis, it may simply not be sensible to block the very small cell sizes, because you might find that virtually every uh, analysis gets blocked. Uh, and so the data custodian can switch off that, that command will give it a very a lower level. 
Um, all commands and outputs that go onto the Dead Shield go onto the remote servers, so they're saved, and we can therefore look at things in retrospect if there is a, a, um, a disclosure event. And finally, the thing that we're now doing, which I think will be discussed more during the meeting, is that we've realized we've got to move to more active disclosure control. And so two things that we're going to likely to do are start introducing uh, functions that run after every function uh, is run on DataShield, that there'll be a sweep of, the, of what's happening on the server side to make sure nothing bad has been controlled. And secondly, we're going to look at ways that may include AI to explore what's been done in the, the log of the command log to see if we can identify that someone's trying to do something that they shouldn't be allowed to do. One more minute. Okay. Is that giving me, have I got two extra minutes because of that loss? Yes. Okay, great. So, so uh, key issue, disclosure controls then. First of all, you should never promise complete removal of any risk of disclosure, whatever you do there is always a risk of disclosure. What our role is to um, make sure, third point down, we need to be transparently persuade study participants, uh, and data generators and data custodians that we're doing everything reasonable to reduce the risk of disclosure to an acceptable level. So this is what's important for the GDPR. And the word transparently here is important. It's not that we're trying to con uh, anybody assessing in relation to GDPR that what we're doing is okay, it's that we can be say exactly what we're doing and they can then decide whether they think it's okay or not. Any efforts exposed expended on disclosure control should balance the real risk uh, of disclosure with, with the real costs associated with doing it. It takes time and effort to do disclosure control, so don't just use it uh, willy nilly if you don't need it. The disclosure control should make it very difficult for someone to get around them without leaving clues in their analysis, and that's what you can then track in the, uh, the log, the command log, uh, which is the point about the permanent record. And then, uh, and, and so then we can do the post hoc investigation disclosure events. So, final slide. So, final thoughts are that like any approach to analysis or joint co analysis, there is little point in applying data shield to data, unless the data have first been cleaned and harmonized. Uh, otherwise the results may actually be misleading. And the point is that initial pre data preparation can often take much more work than the data shield analysis itself. So don't ignore it. It's recommended that the data processing servers that are usually Opal servers uh, are um, kept separate from the servers that hold your main data systems for a study. And data should always be pseudonymized uh, whenever, you're, whenever that's possible. Any uh, rational overall data management strategy for your data needs to take advantage of the complementary strengths of central warehousing and remote federation analysis. Although data shields developed for remote federation analysis, it, it works equally well on a single uh, central warehouse. Um, and finally, last point, DataShield provides an effective solution to a range of challenges in data management, but it is not always appropriate. Some uh, groups, or when they start using DataShield, think they have to use it for everything, but you don't. Okay, that's it, thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. That was, that's, that's really great. And I'm sure will be um, very useful for all the people who are new uh, to DataShield. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand using the button in the reactions uh, tab on the bottom uh, tile bar. Um, oh, sorry, I finally, sorry, I just suddenly realised that what I was meant to put this slide up as well, which basically says that the um, these are the websites for our key things in particular, the, the Data Shield Forum. Okay. Yeah, in fact, it's datashield.org now, but uh, <laughs> it's this website still reads. Oh my God, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but there I are, if, for, 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 for people who are watching, datashield.org, uh, and you can find on the main website the links to the various other uh, support mechanisms that we have, the communication tools, so the GitHub repository. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge on the wiki um, about how to do analyses. And of course, the Data Shield Forum, I would highly recommend people 
registering and participating in that. It's the primary uh, method of communication that is used. Um, I can see that Jennifer has her hand up. So I'm going to unmute Jennifer. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can perfect. Do you, yeah. Hi, Paul, good to see you. I didn't turn on my video because I'm a little sick as you can hear in my voice. Cool. Um, thanks for the presentation. So we've been trying to get information to install Data Shield in the suite of tools available at our institute here in Norway. And we're both in athlete and life cycle. Um, and so our IT team and our privacy security team is working with me to try to do a risk analysis. And they're very interested in looking at some of the things that you presented in more detail, like the parser and the disclosure risk. Does DataShield have a set of documents? Um, CEDO has helped us get some things, but is there like a standard set of documents that we can use so that our institute can do what they need to do to install? Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Jennifer. And first of all, I should say to everybody else that Jennifer is one of the people who's been uh, involved or you be, been in touch with Data Shield right since the very start. Um, so, um, so the, the first thing is that there are, there is information about the uh, about the parser, etc. Um, however, can I, can I ask a question to Stuart? Can you hear me, Stuart? Yes, I can. Do you know? So the parser. So th there's an issue, Jennifer. So first of all, the life cycle uh, and your group obviously is working, doing a lot with a lot of things with Data Shield, as you say. Um, one of the things that you're doing is that you are working with Armadillo now rather than Opal as your primary thing. What I don't know, and this is what I'm asking Stuart, is does the does does all the documentation for the Opal um, parser also apply to the Armadillo parser? Uh, it is it is actually essentially the same parser. Okay. Maybe slightly different version, uh, but right. essentially the same. Um, and any documentation we have or we write will apply to both. Okay, and is there, at the moment, is there documentation that, that is easily readable by, uh, one of the issues about the parser is it's actually, it, it's, it's quite complex. It took me, and it, when I first started looking at Jennifer, it was, it took me some time to even understand uh, how it works because it doesn't work by stopping things, it works by allowing things. And so, and so you, you have to get your mind around it a bit. Um, at that time that I read that, Stuart, there was obviously helpful uh, yeah, information the, for me. Is there information that other people could read now? Um, there, I wouldn't say there's a, a, a document about it, but that does certainly sound like it, or it should be on the list of support documents, documents we provide. Yeah. If, that is, if that is the sort of question which uh, uh, technical and governance people are uh, uh, asking about. Yeah, I mean, they're concerned about all of the standard stuff like disclosure, control, you know, privacy, confidential, all of the things you would imagine if you were an institute trying to decide whether you would make this tool available to all your researchers for their collaboration. So we've been kind of hunting around. I looked on the data shield page, but it would be really helpful to have a standard set of documentation that institutes can use. Um, because, it, I mean, everybody in life cycle, they're going to be trying to deal with the same thing for, yeah. for continuing keeping Data Shield installed for the next projects. So I'm going to jump in here as well, actually, and say um, I'm giving a talk tomorrow about the Data Shield Advisory Board and talking about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and this is, is definitely something that's on our radar uh, uh, for the wider community because it's it's many institutes it's everybody who needs this kind of information um so yes it's it's something that we're working on and that we want to get community involved in and help us yeah. to work on that as well yeah um, thanks andre so can I, can I just say that so we we already do have specific plans for writing some things but we ha haven't done them yet um as well apart from some minor bits that's just mentioned um however one of the things that, as, as we're seeing, that the, one of the big changes in Data Shield is this is this increasing move to try and make as much use of um, 
the community, uh, so researchers outside the central team. And one of the reasons for doing that is that the central team is seeing that disclosure control uh, in a much more active sense is something that we have to focus on as a main thing that we do, because that's not something you can reasonably ask um, people elsewhere to be doing. And so we are going to definitely be, uh, as, uh, uh, as Andre is saying, we are definitely going to be focusing on doing every, a load of things, including writing the documentation. Okay, that's brilliant. I'm going to wrap this session up now. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, all the information that you have presented to us. Uh, just a quick note that there's a uh, session at the end of tomorrow, um, which is available. It's a support session at 4.30 UK time. It's going to be 5.30 in Europe, uh, which is a support Q&A for developers and users. Mm -hmm. So if there are further questions relating to this, um, then please feel free to bring them to that session tomorrow or to ask them on the forum or to, to even ask them in the chat and someone will try and help you. Um, it's my great pleasure now, I think, to, uh, to introduce the next talker, who is Tanya Sarcevic, I hope I've said that correctly, who is going to talk, us about, talk to us about Wellfort, uh, which is an auditable privacy preserving data analysis platform for SMEs, and I believe incorporates um, DataShield into that platform. So, uh, Tanya, over to you. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much, Andre, for the introduction. Um, okay, I will first share my screen with you. And I should have said as well that you're from SBA Research, yeah. uh, which is the, the organization that you're working for. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's exciting to, uh, to participate in this uh, conference. Okay, so I hope you see my presentation. Perfect, yes. yes. So we'll give you about 25 minutes. 20, All right, minutes. I hope to stay in time. Um, okay, so hello everyone once again. Uh, I'm really glad to be presenting and I'm also glad to, and looking forward to hear other talks today and tomorrow. Um, my name is Tanya Šačević. I am a PhD student at Technical University of Vienna and I am a researcher from SBA Research. We are the biggest um, research center in uh, Austria for IT security with about 130 people and yeah we are dealing with um, different aspects of IT security. We are mostly researchers but there are also security consultants and so on. Uh, I'm personally part of uh, machine learning and data management group uh, where, um, uh, sorry, do you see my screen correctly? Yep, yeah. the screen is visible. Okay. Uh, it's still on the first slide. Ah, okay, changed, okay, but... no, no problem. Okay, something strange happened, so, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to say, I'm a part of uh, data management and uh, uh, machine learning group in SBA, that, and we've uh, specifically focus on uh, privacy and security in machine learning processes. Um, so Wellfort is uh, what I'm going to present today. This is a research project and uh, this platform is currently in a stage of a prototype where DataShield is also employed as a privacy preserving data analysis part of the title. So um, this presentation is going to describe Wellfort in general and also show how DataShield was incorporated as such in this platform that is targeting uh, small and medium organizations. Um, I will start a bit uh, with a bit of a motivation behind the Wellfort and the general scenario that we assume and that actually motivates uh, the requirements for our platform. Um, I will briefly describe the conceptual architecture with an emphasis on the component where DataShield plays a role, which is a trusted analysis environment. Uh, and we will have a closer look here how DataShield is incorporated uh, with conjunction, uh, in conjunction with Opal and how is it used in the prototype of our platform. Um, so, why Wellfort? Why a platform that enables privacy preserving data analysis while also being auditable? Um, well, uh, we, we recognize a few gaps that generally exist in uh, collecting personally sensitive data, for example, in medical domains. And these gaps 
limit and uh, in a way challenge uh, medium and small organizations in storing this data and analyzing it to the full potential. So first of all, the data protection regulations, such as GDPR in the EU, uh, provide on the one hand uh, the um, rights uh, for data subjects and control who and how access their data. But from the perspective of uh, designing an analysis, uh, data analysis platform, here the regulations are rather posing um, a challenge because one needs to comply uh, the quite high data protection standards. And they usually limit uh, the amount of analysis possible or the quality of analysis. And additionally, when dealing with sensitive data, um, it is very important to keep uh, the transparency of the, of the system and understand how and how is the data used in the process and who is using the data. So these things might be unachievable by, by small and medium organizations because uh, this might require big budgets or uh, big human expertise uh, and so on. So our solution, uh, is the proposed platform where the data can be, first of all, securely stored by small and medium organizations uh, and the privacy preserving uh, data analysis can be conducted. And also we provide provenance and auditability for, for the data and for the processes to, to increase trust and to enable reproducibility of the results. Um, to clarify a bit the general scenario for the welfare platform, um, I will give an example by introducing uh, the actors um, and how they interact with the platform. And this example also motivates uh, some of our requirements for the welfare, but I will come to that later. So let's say we have two health apps, one from company H, one from company M, and uh, they record uh, a disjoint set of data. This means that, for example, data age monitors heart rate and M monitors cholesterol levels of the users. So they're both small companies, so they don't want to manage the data themselves. They want to store this data somehow on the cloud and uh, not, not want to have anything to do with development or maintaining this platform themselves. Um, then there might be users that use both apps and, of course, users that use only one app. And this is important. This means that data from the same individuals can exist in uh, data stores of both these apps. Um, the users additionally uh, can give consent to what type of uh, analysis their data can be used. For example, user consider sharing data only for research purposes. Um, then. Uh, a researcher is another actor here, and researcher wants to do some analysis. For example, build the machine learning model on the relationship between these things that uh, these companies record, so heart rate and cholesterol level, and they look for suitable data for building their model, and in the same time, they want to be sure to comply with the privacy regulations. Um, additionally, what is possible is uh, that the user uh, from some of the company, for example, uh, so the user of one of the apps, for example, uh, from company M, um, want to know how their data is used. In this case, the auditor of the platform can also provide the information that, in this case, for example, a researcher used their data to, um, uh, to build their model. Um, so to, through these described scenarios, I would like to highlight some of the requirements of Welford uh, and mention actually some additional requirements. Um, so these requirements fall under two main groups. These are privacy preserving data mining requirements and auditability. Um, so firstly, uh, the platform must enable data analysis through, uh, through yeah, so, um, yeah, through the platform, it must be enabled data analysis, but without disclosing individual user data. Um, so this is where the data shield actually will help us with meeting this requirement. And uh, I want to point, point out here that this analysis can and should be uh, possible to be conducted from one uh, source. Uh, so for example, from, uh, from the data only from one app and 
from the cross-platform um, data, which means combining the data from different sources. Um, then among those uh, requirements that were mentioned uh, in a previous slide in the is uh, the data policy management. So this would mean that we ensure that uh, the users are offered a fine-grained consent on, how, on their data usage. Um, some other requirements for the Welfort uh, that are maybe less relevant for this presentation today uh, is, for example, data publishing. So we want to enable the analyst uh, downloading the data in anonymized form to still uh, fulfill the privacy regulations. And this means either applying K-anonymity on, um, on the data or generating synthetic data. Um, there are also aud auditability requirements, uh, so provenance of data, provenance of uh, the analysis, and uh, retention of uh, minimal metadata after data deletion. But uh, these are also maybe less relevant for this, this presentation today. Um, so this is our uh, uh, conceptual architecture. Um, of course, the data shield will have a smaller, smaller role here in, in, this, big, uh, in, this, uh, in this big picture here. Um, so just uh, to, to generally introduce the architecture, we have three main components. Uh, these are the secure repository. This is where we store raw data that are up the, that is uploaded by the users or by the um, companies that are uh, having the data. Uh, then we have audit box that is responsible for collecting and managing data provenance. Uh, and uh, we have the trusted analysis environment that is responsible for enabling uh, privacy preserving analysis. As I mentioned before, we also have a couple of actors. So first, we have an uploader. This is the company or app or uh, better, the users who store their data in the platform and who give the consent to analyze the data. Uh, then another actor we have is analyst. Uh, the analyst in, interacts with two interfaces in our platform. So uh, one of these is uh, experiment setup interface in secure repository where the analyst defines their study. So what, what purpose is the study going to have and uh, which type of data they would need. And uh, the other interface is analysis interface in trusted analysis environment, environment where they actually run their experiments, where they run their code. Um, also, the third actor is the auditor. And this is, this is the actor that um, is able to um, answer some specific audit questions, such as when and by whom the data was used. Uh, so let's look at now uh, at the most interesting uh, part in this case. This is the trusted analysis environment. Uh, this component is where the data analysis happens. So the workflow that I highlighted here with a red arrow is the relevant one for the privacy preserving analysis functionality of the welfare platform. Um, so it starts uh, where the analyst defines their study in the experiment setup interface. Uh, then if the... Um, if the con conditions are met, the experimental setup is initiated successfully. So this means that uh, that uh, the, through the through the controller, um, we we kind of figure out if there is enough data to conduct the study and if the given consent is uh, matching uh, what actually analyst wants to do with the data. And then if this is uh, if this is successful, the loader retrieves the requested data. A uh, the raw data in this at this point and transforms it to uh, clean CSV files and uploads it to analysis database in our trusted analysis environment. And then the analyst is able to interact with uh, analysis interface where they are able to perform their analysis. So here they indirectly um, through the analysis a server have an access to the data that is uh, stored in the analysis database and obtain their results. Um, to be more specific on how the trusted analysis environment is realized in our prototype, um, so let's start with the analysis database. This is a component where the data is re retrieved for a specific user study 
And uh, here the data is stored for a limited amount of time and is available for analysis. And this, at this point, this data is, um, is clean and in the right format for, for the analysis. So uh, the loader already um, transforms the, transformed it from the raw data. Um, in this prototype, um, in our prototype, this is a PostgreSQL database that Opal is connected uh, to as its storage database. Um, the import to this database is done through the loader component from, the, from our secure repository. And this is done through the automated uh, REST commands. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is where the data is, the raw data is basically transformed and loaded uh, as in a, in a CSV format. So the Opal is the actual analysis server component in our prototype. And Opal allows the data import to the database and enables the access permission management. So this, uh, this way only authenticated analysts can operate uh, on, the, on the data sets retrieved for their studies. So the studies that they, they initiated and they have uh, kind of um, permission to access to. Uh, finally, Opal provides an R client which analyst uh, uses and uh, conduct uh, to to conduct their analysis. So uh, this is mm, the the analysis is conducted through data shield packages. Uh, the analysis is then performed in the analysis interface. Uh, this is where we employ R Studio, and through R Studio. Uh, the analyst connects to Opal and has access through, uh, of course, through data shield functions uh, to the data that is initiated for their studies. And then they can perform the analysis on, uh, and obtain their results. Um, so all of the immediate results, uh, for example, the clean data tables that are in the analysis database, uh, stored in the analysis database, um, the, these are stored temporarily and all of these immediate results are deleted after the study expires. Um, so this is basically how the analysts uh, are assigned their own Opal tables for processing. And these tables uh, contain the types of attributes that analysts specifically requested for a certain study. For example, uh, they requested cholesterol level and a heart rate and age to be able to um, build their machine learning model, for example. And uh, these also need to already comply to the consent that is given by the users. Uh, and this cleanup or this selection, let's say, is already taken care by the secure repository before it comes to the analysis database. Um, and then basically the analyst can can do their analysis on this data as long as it's within data shield functionalities, because uh, this is the only way to, to access the data, of course, in an aggregated form. Um, so some of the future challenges that I would like to mention here uh, for our, for actually our analysis environment component of Welford platform um, would be, uh, extending the functionality spectrum of DataShield, uh, which would, of course, automatically mean more capabilities for our analysis environment, so uh, more sophisticated results for the analysts uh, that are using our platform. And there is, I think, quite some progress with this since uh, I, I dare to mention the, the DataShield community is uh, really active uh, in this field. Um, and then, Another challenge uh, would be analysis of uh, vertically partitioned data. So this is actually something that is solved already within Welford platform, but not through data shield. Because as I described in our scenarios, we deal with data where uh, the information about the same individuals uh, exists across multiple sources, as opposed to what is uh, usually um, scenario with data shield uh, usage as, as far as understood, where basically the data records with the same set of attributes are uh, distributed across multiple sources. So um, as I heard, th this is actually this uh, date, uh, the record linkage um, 
situation that uh, that we would have here and Paul really nicely also mentioned this before so I am uh, optimistic about this and I really wonder what uh, what is the input from the data shield community on on this issue because this is uh, this is something that uh, we deal with uh, primarily in in the scenario of uh, of Welford platform um, yeah, for more details on a well form, I would like to uh, uh, point you to our paper that is recently accepted at uh, Semantic Web Journal. Um, and there is also a link uh, to, to more details on the Wellford platform. So that's that would be it from me. I think I'm a bit ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for your talk. And it's really, uh, for me, it's really amazing to hear about how things are being used uh, outside of the, the academic community that, that much of us come from already. Um, so it's, it's really great to hear that. Um, there's already one question from Paul, so I'm going to unmute mm -hmm. you now. Paul, please. Hello. Hello. So, can, I, can, I check, can, can people hear me? Because I, I've realized yes. I've seen the chat that I would, that Jennifer Harris wasn't able to hear me at one point. We I don't know my is it not very good, my speech? No, it's fine. Just uh, oh, okay. fire, away, right. fire away with your question. Okay, fine. Great. So, um, so Tanya, thanks. That's, that's really, really uh, interesting. Um, just to tell you, so it would be great uh, to maybe chat with you after the conference about a vertical data shield, because the reason we haven't, it's basically vertical data shields is considerably more difficult than horizontal basically nice. because you've got to include the encryption decryption cycles to uh, allow you to protect the information uh, between the sources. Um, and although we've, we've done a number of proof of principle over the well, basic right since back to probably 2012. And there we lost Paul. Oh, okay. I thought this was uh, my connection for it. No, I think- Because it happened Paul. before today. <laughs> Um, so I think he was going to say that we were we were prototyping vertical data shield um, sort of around 2014, 20 to 2016. Um, mm -hmm. We prototyped it for, um, um, I think, uh, generalized way to generalize linear modeling functions. Um, but the demand for horizontally horizontal data shield or for data shield for horizontally partitioned data just was so huge that we had to put that on the back burner. Um, however, I guess maybe he was, I'm going to preempt what he was going to say, which was possibly was going to say that um, now we might have more interest in continuing that line of development. So maybe we could bring people together um, to, to start working on something like that. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in there, Becca, just to say <laughs> that, that yeah, we, we are really interested in vert vertical data shield now, and we have a number of specific use cases for it. So we would be very interested in hearing from other people with specific use cases for vertical data shield. Yeah, great. This is this is very uh, great to hear because I also think I remember maybe from the last year there was some discussion already in the forum of uh, data shield about the vertically partitioned data. But um, I understand this is way bigger challenge than horizontally partitioned, of course. Holly. Holly, we, we can't, can't, hear, can't you. hear you. Do you want to? <laughs> you can come in here if you want and ask a question. <laughs> Ollie just upgraded his Zoom session, so that's why it doesn't work, probably. <laughs> I, I think he's coming in here. Yeah. Good idea to do it just before <laughs> the conference. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Never upgrade mid conference. Um, <laughs> So yeah, really, really interesting talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was going to ask, are you doing anything with the audit data or the usage data from Data Shield? You know, what people, what functions people are running, that kind of thing. Um, so this is, I mean, this is still, um, we are just allowing um, now to answer some specific queries, such as, uh, for example, if the individual um, wants to trace in which studies their data is uh, used, uh, they are able to do that. Or um, I think also uh, the all the analysis, so from the all analysts, uh, we can audit their um, 
conducted analysis, so any function that they conducted a, at some point. But um, yeah, as I said, this is something that uh, the prototype that has happened recently, so we haven't uh, gone too far um, mm. with this. Yeah. Yeah. No. Again, I think that's something would be really interested to to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. That's certainly a, a focus of of our thinking at the minute. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we also have a question from Yannick. Um, uh, which I'm struggling. Yannick is um, muted. Yeah, I'm struggling. I think he's unmuted now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you, Yannick. Yeah, so thank you for this presentation of this uh, data integration. I was wondering, uh, do you plan to deal with uh, non-tabular data? Because currently, what uh, you expect is that uh, the data will fit in a SQL database, but it could be a JSON. Could document, you speak or... up? Because it's very, I can hardly hear you. Yeah, it's my microphone. <laughs> I have trouble as well. Uh, so would you be able to handle data that are not uh, tabular, like, uh, I don't know, multi-dimensional ones, uh, JSON documents, uh, Mm -hmm. big data set that cannot be moved, uh, things like that? Um, mm, so, I mean, maybe, maybe in the future, I don't want to say no, <laughs> uh, but currently we are only doing this with relational data because this is the, this is the scenario that we are dealing with and we have a few uh, company partners that are providing us with, uh, with such data. And of course, for us, the challenge is to actually uh, the, the challenge that we maybe still need to somehow overcome is basically the this data comes in different uh, forms from different uh, sources from different apps or companies. So we internally need to unify the format to be able then to clean it and to uh, to to make it ready uh, in CSV formats, for example, to to actually. Uh, uploaded to the database. So we didn't uh, yet look at this further, but this would be maybe also um, interesting. So we are mostly doing this in the, in the medical medical domain, as, as I also mentioned with our scenarios. This is uh, uh, medical apps, basically, uh, which provides a, provide us the relational data. So this is what uh, this is what we are dealing with. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Tanya, for your presentation and for the discussion afterwards. Um, we look forward to, to hearing more and to, uh, I'm sure people look forward to discussing with you about vertically partitioned data and, and how it can be used and how data can be uh, used in these situations. Uh, we're going to move on now to the final talk before lunch, uh, which is by Hugh Garner, who is a member of the Data Shield team. He's, he's done quite a bit of work on load testing and containerization methods and data management and has interest in visualization method methodology as well. And he's going to talk to us about Data Shield iCure. So Hugh, uh, you wanna share your screen? Okay. So. Can everybody see that? Uh, yeah, we've, perfect. We've got the main screen up and we can hear you. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm Hugh Garner. Uh, I work with the core data shield team at, uh, at Newcastle, uh, working on data shield development. Uh, and we're currently doing a program called the iCure, um, which is the innovation to commercialization of the university research. Uh, and it's an Innovate UK funded program, uh, fairly short term, it's only 16 weeks. But the idea is to help university researchers validate uh, business ideas and perform some market discovery um, uh, with the potential at the end of it to, to get some follow-on funding. So what are we doing? Well, we're currently exploring routes to commercialise Data Shield uh, and get some sustainable funding for long-term development. Um, I would say that that doesn't mean we're not committed to open source and that, that of course, the core Data Shield uh, product will always remain uh, open source. But really, we're trying to find out what sectors Data Shield might be applicable to. Obviously, it's been used extensively for epidemiological and healthcare research um, up to this point. Um, but we believe it might be applicable to, to many more sectors. Um, 
and how might it be useful in those sectors? So try and talk to lots of different um, groups uh, and companies and understand their data analysis requirements and data access requirements and where their pain points might be. And then to understand what development might be needed for Day Shield to make it uh, a product that we could um, exploit commercially. So as part of this, we, we've looked at the core value propositions of Data Shield, and this is really trying to break down exactly uh, what Data Shield can offer to the different sectors uh, and different points. So really, uh, there's five key points here, which is reducing the risk of confidential commercial or personal data leakage uh, when people are seeking to collaborate with data. So it enables compliance with GDPR, um, and it enables people to main control, maintain control of their data IP. It's simple uh, and it's easy to use, so it gives straightforward access to confidential data um, with streamlined governance processes. So it, it's modular, it's flexible, um, it has the potential to fully automate the governance process um, and reduces time uh, and monetary costs in data access. It also allows a real-time analysis of confidential data, uh, which is fairly self-explanatory, um, but crucially, it's user-specified. Um, it enables users to potentially create revenue streams from their confidential data, uh, and this might be applicable to people um, from market research companies, for instance, or polling companies, um, and they could potentially enable um, access to their data using Data Shield. And it also supports more informed decision making from collaborative analysis within or between organizations. So these are our core value propositions and we're trying to look at different sectors. So I'm currently engaged in this 16 week exercise to go and talk to um, people from, from all sorts of things ranging from healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies, financial services, and so forth. Um, uh, and as part of this, we're trying to build a portfolio of evidence that we can use to show that Data Shield has, uh, or understand what commercial potential Data Shield might have. Um, and as part of that, so we hope to be able to ask you some questions now, um, and hopefully this will help us get a better understanding from, uh, with all, from all of you here about how Data Shield might be useful uh, and what sort of sectors you're from. So uh, Alex, if you wouldn't mind sharing your slides. Great, so uh, we're using this platform called Mentimeter, uh, which enables us to do a sort of real-time uh, uh, questionnaire. So if everybody goes to, could go to uh, menti.com, if you don't mind, it's at the top of the top of the slide here, and then you put in the code 430485. And hopefully, once everyone's got set up, we should start seeing some bubbles coming in, um, just to get an idea of what um, what sort of participants we've got here today. That's great. This is the first time I've used Mentimeter, so it's quite quite exciting to see it working as well as it is. And just to just to add to that, that we'll also be using it in other sessions in the uh, conference, so it's. It's great that people are participating. Yeah. Right, we'll just wait a, a, just a minute just for any more answers to come in. Um, could I please share the code? Yeah, the code. So the code is 430485. There we are. Great. Well, it looks like we've we've got all the answers there. Uh, okay, Becca, just if anyone's having trouble, anyone having trouble accessing? Um, Becca's just posted the uh, link in the chat. Fantastic. 
fantastic. Okay. So, uh, Alex, if you wouldn't mind going to the next question. Yep. So. Okay, so what, what primary field um, are, are people from? And this will help us get a better idea of when we collate the data to understand exactly how, how things might be applicable. Could see lots of the health sciences coming in there. I'll just give it a couple of couple of seconds more for any last few answers. Great. So, yeah, primarily from, from the health sciences here, then clearly good stuff. OK, Alex, if you go to the next slide, then, please. So. In your research or, or your work, are there third party data sets you'd like to access but can't? So, for instance, if you're from a hospital, um, are you trying to get access to local government data, but you can't can't access it at the moment due to governance restrictions or confidentiality agreements? If there aren't, if you're not not particularly interested in third party data linkage, just just answer no. Right. Just give it a couple more seconds for the last few answers to come in. Great, so there's a clear case that people are interested in, in third party data access. That's grand. Okay, so next slide then please, Alex. So what do you see as the primary barrier to enabling data access? Um, I'm not sure whether is this is a free text field, Alex. I think it is. So this, this should be a free text. Yeah. yeah. So if you just put in any any thoughts you have on, on, on how what you see is the most the, the primary problem with enabling or accessing data. Doesn't have to be a long essay. Just just any thoughts that come into your head. Oh, great. Fantastic. So it's clear that legal and governance issues and ethics are, are a primary concern, um, and that would presumably tie into GDPR. Again, rigid access rules, data to custodians, legal departments. Fantastic. Just a few more seconds for any final answers to come in. Great, thanks very much. So, uh, Alex, do you want to move to the next one? So this is trying to get an understanding of, of where 
you'd like to share or access confidential confidential data so is it internally within your organization is it externally um just to um allow third party access or get access to third party data only or is it both or of course neither <laughs> So a clear case that the majority here wants to both internally share data uh, and externally share or access data. Great. Okay, so next slide then, please, Alex. So if you uh, control confidential data, and really this is a question for those of you who do control or uh, have an association with data sets that, that you, you do control, your organization controls, would you be interested in monetizing access to your data? So would you be interested in selling access to, to third parties externally? So obviously we've previously dealt with lots of epidemiological data, which is collected as part of research groups. Um, the majority of that is um, either free to access or has um, non-profit access. But it's, it's interesting to understand exactly where people feel, feel they might stand on this. Paul just raised the chat. Um, does monetizing include covering uh, that's a good point. Um, I, I don't think it does in this case. So we'd be interested really in people who would like to make profit from, from the data. Great. Okay. So Alex, uh, do you want to put the next slide on? This is the final one. So this is the final question. Um, do you feel that data access restrictions are a barrier to innovation or um, methods development or um, uh, any other kind of innovation? So you can have multiple statements here. So anything that, that you, you feel free to um, put short, short bits of text. Uh, even just a yes or no would be useful. Worth pointing out, you can submit multiple times. Uh, if you want to do two completely different thoughts, you can put the first thought and then a new thing. A new yeah. Thing. So this is interesting, the, the lack of access to data for training or building models. And this is something that, that we're thinking about a lot with the Data Shield team. So, um, and of course, yes, but we still need protection for data subjects, which is is certainly critical especially given the emphasis earlier placed on legal ethical and governance um, restrictions the training data again you scroll down a bit alex This is also interesting. So can't explore what's possible. So um, that would suggest as a case for, for data exploration tools to allow access uh, or limited access. Um, uh, 
Nice. Okay, just give it a minute for any more coming in. Interesting talking about a shortage of expert assistance to help navigate regulatory complexity. And that, of course, GDPR and similar is, is, a, is an important thing to help protect the individual. Great. Okay. So I think we'll leave it there. Um, thanks very much for participating in that. that. That really is very useful and helps us, um, it will help inform our, our case, um, uh, an understanding of, of future development directions and and potential uh, market for data shields. So thanks for your time. Uh, and I'll hand back to, uh, to Andre. Oops. Thank you very much, Hugh. That was, um, that was really interesting. And it was, it was fascinating to see uh, the use of Mentimeter and people's responses. Uh, I have one little comment, which is just to say that I don't think uh, free software is a tool um, uh, anti-commercialization or you know is, is incompatible with commercialization and in fact i would say probably the opposite uh, because the more restrictive the license that you put on the software the more difficult it becomes to commercialize it so it's it's really interesting to have these perspectives and and good luck with the projects and and so on um i see paul has his hand up so paul uh would you like to uh to ask your question can you unmute yourself yeah, I've unmuted. <clears throat> yeah, it basically relates to what you just said, actually. Um, the, could, could I ask you, Hugh, because there's a number of ways oh, yes. that should, should be commercial, uh, of which, some of which aren't really about making a profit. I wonder if you could comment about that. I mean, look, it's like the fact that providing the support for the service is one way you can that you can commercialize it. Are, are there other things other than the direct selling of the software that you'd like to comment on? Yeah, so there are, there are a number of, of models we can look at for um, um, commercializing Data Shield, one of which is, is a support model whereby um, Data Shield, of course, remains free and open to use, um, and much in the way that open source companies like Red Hat. Um, commercialize their um, support uh, and assistance model. Um, there is, of course, bespoke development for um, particular pipeline integrations. Um, and then there might be the potential to look at um, developing particular uh, front ends, for instance, or business information um, system integration, um, which might potentially be commercializable. I see Simon's got his hand up there. Um, yeah, with regard to the potential areas of commercialization for Data Shield, um, I was wondering when you talk about the obviously the sharing of data is one of the, the areas you highlighted, but I wondered whether there was particularly a, an international aspect to that. Um, so one of the things that's very difficult to do, obviously, is to transfer data outside of the EEA if you're working in Europe. So particularly, um, I can imagine uh, uh, collaborations between research groups in, in Europe and, and North America, which is fairly common, run into those problems all the time. So I wondered if that was a particular focus of where you're thinking in terms of a, a business uh, commercialization potential for, for data shipping. Uh, yeah very much so I mean um, part of our core case for this this program was that that um, with the invalidation of the EU, US privacy shield of course there is a very good case now for using software like data shield to enable rapid data sharing um, between organizations that wish to analyze it um, across the Atlantic and, and, and in other countries. So, yeah, we, we're certainly looking at that. And I'm, I'm talking to a number of um, companies who might be interested in doing that.
Any other questions? I, I was just going to say, yeah. sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah. was just going to say that um, one of the additional services um, that I thought of, of that could potentially, I guess, be monetized or whatever, um, would be testing and auditing of functions because we're having discussions at the moment about um, all the community packages being developed and things and how do we, you know, as, as part of the data shield advisory board as well, coming up with a, a process to uh, audit and review functions and test them. There's no reason why that service couldn't be provided on a cost basis. And I think, I imagine that a lot of people will want that to pay for a service to, 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 to sanity check those functions, basically. Um, obviously that, that has been a very structured way. I would agree totally. Um, sorry, I'm muting Hugh for a second. I would agree totally. I think it's about the services that are provided that could be commercialized is a, a good way to go. Um, so yeah, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I think, I mean, it's been, it's been a fantastic morning so far. Thank you very much, Hugh, for, for that talk. Uh, thank you to all our other speakers as well. Um, it's, been, it's been really wonderful. We now have a lunch break. The breakout rooms will be open again, so you're welcome to join them and to talk to other um, attendees at the conference. And uh, it is 25 past 12 in the UK, it's 25 past one here in Paris and, and the rest of uh, mainland Europe or Central Europe. Uh, we will be meeting back again in just over one hour uh, to have the next part of the conference, um, which uh, will kick off with a, a talk by CEDO on the uh, integration of DataShield with the Armadillo platform and with the Molgenis suite, which I think will be very interesting because uh, that's not something that many of us have experience of, but it, it is certainly being used uh, in the, um, the Lifecycle Consortium and is another way of integrating data shield and using data shield uh, alongside data harmonization uh, as, aside from the um, abiba suite that is used by some of the other people so we look forward to seeing you all again in just over an hour have a really nice lunch break um, and we'll chat to you as well in the breakout rooms so see you soon bye bye